Hello and welcome to Women of Contributions Inspiring Conversations with me, your host, Kazia Luckett. Now, before we speak to our very first guest on this show, I wanted to run some figures past you and they're pretty big numbers. So in the UK, we have a total of 41 million. In Australia, we have over 30 million. And in the US, we have over 230 million. Now, these are lovely round figures, and I, I'm sure if that landed in your bank account, it would really make your heart sing. But I was surprised to learn that these numbers represent the amount of money that has been scammed out of hardworking women and men around the world through online dating scams. Now, although these are big numbers, the FBI estimate that only 15% of these crimes are even reported because people are way too embarrassed to tell about their experience. But last year, I met one inspiring woman who has stepped forward as the voice for so many that do not feel brave enough to step forward for themselves. So today, I am so excited to be joined by inspirational speaker, entrepreneur, and best-selling author of The Woman Behind the Smile, Debbie Montgomery Johnson. So thank you so much for joining me today, Debbie. I'm so excited to be here as always, my friend. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, before we start delving into your experience of online dating and the scams that are associated with it, before you started online dating, life, if we go back a while, was pretty good until obviously the death of your husband. Can you just set the scene for those people that are listening? Yeah, I mean, I was married, I was going on 26 years, and I have four children. Now I have four grandchildren. I was as happily married as anybody could be happily married after 26 years. You know, you've got your ups and your downs in married life, but uh, things were good, and Lou had his own business, and I was working as a treasurer for one of the local school districts. And, um, and I got that call on Sept what was it, April, April 8th, 2010, and it was the call that was to, to my son and from my son, and it was, Mom, Dad just died. I'm coming home to take care of everything. And in an instant, my life as I knew it changed completely because all those things we had planned on doing weren't ever going to come to fruition. Uh, my life you know, went from working as a very st non-stressful job at the school district. I'd been a, a banker before and was very stressful stressful job and I, I started working at the school district and it was something that paid the benefits, paid for our medical insurance. But Lou was bringing in all the money with the company and it was a company that he started, he ran, uh, it has, he was manufacturing a vitamin supplement for diabetics that have neuropathy, which is the damage to your nerve endings in your fingers and toes. I didn't have diabetes, I didn't have neuropathy, I didn't have sciatica and all the issues that he had. So when he died and, and I got thrown into running the business, it was his company that I was trying to keep going. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I had to because it paid the bills. And thank goodness I was very resourceful and had careers prior to that. In, I was a legal assistant, I was a banker, I was in the Air Force, and I had enough training in my life that I knew my resources and I knew who to go to. Uh, but I did not know how to run his business and I didn't know much about it. And so the first six months, it was, I was running on empty, trying to you know, keep myself going emotionally, physically, that didn't work out so well. I, I stayed healthy while I, I stayed alive. Um, but all I was doing was working. And I was working 20 hours a day because those four hours at night between two and six was the first time I'd really been by myself for an extended period of time. And that king size bed was really big. And I slept in a very small part of it. And I, my emotions at night were ranged from being angry that he died, to being sad that he died, to being lonely that he died, and, and all those things wrapped together, and then the responsibility of running the business, being the mother, you know, I only had one child still at home, the other three were, were either in school or off in the military. Um, but I had all the responsibilities. And then to boot, well, this comes later on, the financial, you know, burden of, of all that. Um, my girlfriends were like, Deb, you need a life. And so very quickly they said, get a life which meant dating. And I, I always say that I didn't like dating when I was 16. And to do it at 52 with all those anxieties of a 16 year old coming back uh, was very difficult. But they're like, try online dating. It's safe. You can do it from the, you know, the, your home. You can do it from your office. Because I had an online business. I was in my office. I was home alone all the time. 
And I figured, well, I can just stalk a little bit and get out there. Because I had friends who had met their husbands through online dating. And I thought it was safe. And I put my foot out there. I went to some faith-based sites, one in particular. And I put my profile out there trying to be as perfect as I could. Because we all want to put up the best profile. And uh, I came with some baggage. But, you know, with that was being a widow, having a company, et cetera, et cetera. And I met a gentleman happened to be from England <laughs> and an uh, international businessman. He was a widower and had a young son and was traveling, uh, was here in the States at the time and was traveling to the, to the Mid East. Actually, he was going to the Far East. And we developed this two year relationship online. I never saw him in those two years because he was doing a business deal over in uh, Malaysia. And one thing led to another. And I'm sure if you, you know, if you want to read the book, it's The Woman Behind the Smile. Uh, it turned out to be a very expensive financial engagement with me because my helpful self got so attached to him as part of my life that I was helping him financially as well as emotionally and everything else. And over the two years, it was, it was a big financial impact in my life. Um, over, over, okay, get, get ready for the, <gasps> it was one of those moments when, uh, when he confessed to me after two years that it had all been a scam. And when he came on in person for the very first time, uh, and it was not the Brit that I was anticipating. It turned out to be a brown haired, brown eyed, brown skinned young man from Nigeria. Um, and I'm looking at him and in an instant, it was God given gift that my two years romance, my two year heart uh, relationship with him was over in a second. And I'm looking at him going, how am I gonna get my money back? You've scammed me for two years. What, how am I gonna get my million dollars back? And he smiled back at me and he goes, can we keep this going? And I'm thinking, are you out of your mind? He says he'd fallen in love with me and that's why he had to ask for my forgiveness and had to confess the scam. Um, but at that point, I mean, my heart was ripped out from underneath me in a, in a way worse than when Lou died because now I'd been part of it and I'd contributed to it and I blamed myself for being so stupid, for being so gullible, for being so vulnerable, for what, you know, ABC, all these things. And in reality, he is part of a group of scammers that are worldwide that are manipulative they're smart they know how to get to the hearts of those that have had some sort of emotional tragedy typically a widow or a divorcee and they're very good at it and he he got me hook line and sinker um and it was really tough because at that point that's where the whole woman behind the smile comes up you know after i tried to report it to the fbi and whoever else i reported it to at the time I was met with, we're sorry, Deb, that it happened, but there's nothing we can do for you because he's out of the country. And at that point, I figured if the FBI couldn't help me, no one was going to be able to help me. And I just shut down and I put up that mask, that put up that smile. And I, I pretended everything was, was fine. You know, my life was fine. And even when friends said, well, where's Eric? I'm like, it just didn't work out. It didn't work out. And they're like, seriously, after two years, that's all you have to tell us that it didn't work out? Well, I didn't want to tell anybody that I had been so, you know, taken by this guy. And uh, because I had all the training, I, you know, I had the legal training, the intelligence training, the financial training. And if anybody shouldn't have been scammed, it was me. But what that proves to me now is that if I was scammed, anybody can be scammed, especially if you're in a vulnerable situation where you've lost something. Or in my case, you know, one of my friends who's a therapist said, I had this big hole in me that had felt I hadn't been listened to for the 26 years I'd been married. And so as he listened to me for two years, it filled up that hole and it made me whole. And honest to goodness, I look back and the blessing of the scam, if you can have one, is that first he confessed and I saw I got a face to what happened, but he filled up that hole and I got my voice back. And now my voice is pretty, um, pretty vocal. Because I don't want it to happen to anybody else going forward. And it happens every day. I think there might be a statistic out there that there, every 35 seconds, someone is getting scammed. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily online dating, but in general, people are getting scammed every 35 seconds. And the ones that are hard on my heart are 
the women that have you know, lost a husband in some way that are looking for love again, or our parents who are being scammed by the IRS scam or the, the um, business executive scam that's going on now. I mean, there are so many, it's incredible the scamming that's going on in the world and they're getting away with it and they're very bold at it because it's very difficult to stop them. Well, when I was doing the research for, for you coming on, um, one of the things that you said just there was that he came on and he showed his, his true self to you um, and then proclaimed to be in love with you and wanted to, to, to carry on. And from doing my research, this is quite a common trend because actually this means that they can continue the relationship and hopefully continue with the scam in one way or another and draw and out most, more money. And most people that have been scammed will be scammed two or three times because in the women I've worked with recently, they don't have any closure. They haven't seen a face. They haven't seen, no, they're not going to believe that the scammer is really a scammer. He may go away for a while and they'll think as I would have thought that maybe he died or he got really ill. And then when he pops up again, he gets sucked back in. I have a friend here that was with me last night at a, at a session and um, she lost her home. She had her home paid for and she took a mortgage out on it and she couldn't pay the mortgage. So she lost her home. Then she lost her savings. You know, she, she left Florida. She went somewhere else and he got back in contact with her and she lost another 90,000. So she lost upwards of a half a million. You know, now she's 67 years old. She's living with a friend. She's having a very difficult time finding a job. And she's beating herself up on the verge of suicide at one point until she saw an article that was written in the Palm Beach Post here about me and my story. And she reached out and we've become friends because she knows that she's not alone. And that's the reason why I'm speaking up because I don't want people to feel like they're the only ones that have been through it, that we have been through it. And yes, we can get through this together. Uh, it can be difficult, especially if you've really been destroyed financially. And I would have been, but I've, the happy part of my story is that I was able to open my heart up to a person in person. And I've remarried, and he's been very, very good to me, very supportive of me. And, but my, if that hadn't have happened, uh, my, my life would be completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to offer women hope that if you're willing to, you'll never get loved again, if you don't, if you're not willing to get hurt, because if you, if you harden your heart to being loved at all anymore, you'll stay hard. It'll be a cold stone and you'll never have that opportunity. And, and I look back and I'm thinking, golly, how, how could I, you know, months after the scam happened, I met my husband and I was so willing to just be open, but he was willing to tell me things that had happened in his life. He showed the vulnerability and the honesty first. And when he did that, that allowed me to feel comfortable enough to open up to him. And when I told him my story and said, if you can hang in after that, we're good to go. And I didn't date anybody after that, you know, so. So, with, so obviously there's been a happy ending, but you talked um, about the fact that you were going around with this, this mask on. You were going around saying everything's fine, just didn't work out, you know, life happens. And I would imagine that you'd been doing that leading after your husband died, maybe even before your husband died. And what I'm interested to know is at what point did you go enough's enough? I cannot physically, mentally, and emotionally carrying on with putting up this mask of everything being absolutely fine? Well, it's really interesting because I look back on my life in total, and I, I did this when I was writing the book, is I had to look back and say, you know, what created this? What created me? Why did I feel like I had to be perfect? Why was I so competitive and had to be, you know, smart and athletic and yada, yada all these things that I think were I thought my parents wanted me to be that way, or I thought I needed to be that way, um, and I did. And 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 there was only one time in my life when I was when we moved here to Palm Beach County, probably 25 years ago, 30 years ago, and a good friend of mine, a few years after I had met her at first, said, "You know what? When we first moved into this area, someone told me not to be friends with you because you're you're a little bit snobby," and that really took me by surprise. I'm like, "Why do you think that?" She goes. 
And it turned out it's because I'm very private, but I want things to look perfect, you know? So nobody ever saw the crack in my veneer. They didn't see, you know, the honest Deb that had four kids under the age of eight and my mother-in-law living with me and, you know, my husband was this and, and you know, I, I, my family was perfect. At least that's what I wanted people to believe because I felt like my family, you know, growing up, my mom wanted us to look perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, we were in a small town and my dad was the local dentist and everything was perfect. And it wasn't, it was good as my life was good, but it wasn't perfect. And when there were some things that happened that shook me to my core, I didn't want anybody to know because I was embarrassed that my perfect life had some flaws in it. And when I was talking to a friend of mine a couple years after the scam, um, before I came out and told anybody, I was sitting at a, a lunch with her and she mentioned online dating and I rolled my eyes at her. You can imagine, because I hadn't told my story to anybody. And she said, what's that all about? And I said, I got to tell you something that happened. And I opened it up, told her and another friend, and she's looking at me and she's like, you have to tell your story. I said, no, uh, I'm not going to tell this. You have to tell your story, Deb. And the reason she said that is because her mother had been taking for, taken for $80,000, a scam. Another friend of mine had been involved in a Ponzi scheme twice. Another friend had actually lived with a guy for a year and it turned out he had another family in another state and she'd been through it for a whole year. None of those women said a thing to anybody around them. But because, why? But why? Because, because we're so, we don't want people to think we're stupid. Well, you no, know? no, we not only want, don't people want to think that we're stupid, we have this this veneer, this image that needs to be upheld. And I think it's, it's brilliant at the moment because we're seeing so many people stepping forward and going, I'm vulnerable. This is me. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. This is my story. And hopefully by sharing my story, I'm going to inspire, empower, and ignite something in you. But so many people are, are going around trying to keep the, the, the element of perfection going. We think we must have been taught that there must have been something, you know, you never air out your dirty laundry or I mean, my grandmother, she you never, you know, no one ever knew that she had plastic on her couch in the living room. <laughs> you know, I never got into the living room. Um, but that was kept for best. Exactly. But you know, you die before the best is used. Yes. And so when I, when I finally started to talk, you know, I got women buying in. I, I would tell my story and the heads would be bobbing. It wouldn't necessarily be the online dating scam, but it was something in their life that had happened, either a miscarriage or a divorce or infidelity or something happened, and they hid that story because they didn't want anybody else to know. And I'm thinking, you know what? Your story could help the woman sitting beside you be brave enough to tell her story because her story is your story, and she just needs a friend to hold a hand with. Yeah. And last night when I was speaking at this the little conference here, it's called Happiness Club in Palm Beach. As soon as I stole it, started telling my story, women were like, my mom was taken, or my neighbor, or my friend, or I. I had a couple of people, I felt like, you know, the hairdresser, they come up and they start telling the stories. I had people coming up and whispering in my ear last night, that happened to me, we need to connect. And as far as I'm concerned, that's why I started speaking, because I want one person to feel that connection and say, okay, I did such and such, I own it. I did it, I need to put it behind me, that if I can help another person along the way, then that's why we're here. We're, I love it that we're spiritual beings having a mortal experience, and we're not supposed to do it alone. We're supposed to do it with someone. And it gives me such power when I, when I find one person, of course it irritates me too when I hear these scammers are still happening, but if I can contribute to one person either healing or not doing it, then, I, then I've, I've been successful. And your, and your message and your, your mission is spreading far and wide. I know that we were talking, you've been on the news, on the TV, you've done a radio show, you've written your book, The Woman Behind the Smile. You, your, your video clip has even gone as far as down to Mexico and being translated into to Spanish in order to make sure that people are aware of what's happening. But in doing so, interestingly enough, you said earlier on that in doing so, you've now become a target again 
for the scammers. Can you explain to everybody why that would be? It happens because the scammers are banking on us not talking. They're successful because they know that people don't want to feel stupid. They don't want to feel used. They know they're not going to tell anybody what's happened. And that typically is true. And so when there's someone that comes up and starts challenging them, even though I believe many of them are cowards and they're hiding behind the internet across the ocean, um, they come across as being very bold, audacious, uh, angry, when they get when they get called out, um, threatening when they get called out, and now I'm receiving you know emails and phone calls from guys pretending to be special agents with the Interpol. <laughs> I out to our friends, you know, there's some of the girls in in the book. I reached out. I'm like, because I don't know anything about Interpol. I said, you guys, do they call you? And they're like, no. You know, they send officers, and so I was able. To, I went went back, and unfortunately, I engaged with this man twice um, verbally, and I said. I want to see the FBI. You send the FBI to me. I'm not going to deal with you, agent so-and-so. And, -so. and um, then I start getting emails. I'm, we're going to prove to you. It's the Treasury Department now. It's this. It's that. It's you know Interpol. And they're very good. They use um, stationery. That was Interpol stationery signed by the woman that's head of the Interpol. They use the Department of Treasury stationery. They cut and paste your name in. The most blatant, stupid thing that they did was that they sent a letter the other day. Uh, from uh, United Bank of Africa. Well, you know, I'm not dealing with the United Bank of Africa, but they said your MasterCard pin needs to be validated. And I'm looking at this email and it's written to my late husband and me. There's a picture of a Visa card front and back with our names on it. And here they're writing about a MasterCard, but it's a Visa card. I'm like, okay, so this is really stupid. But apparently it's worked before with other people because they wouldn't be sending it to me if they hadn't used it before and it had, and it had worked. Yes. You know? So the only thing that I can do, I did call this, so the uh, Secret Service and they said, try to get a hold of Interpol. I wrote to Interpol. If you actually go to their website, they acknowledge that their stationary letterhead is being used by scammers. So they said, just report it as scam. Uh, same with the Treasury Department. I reported it again to the FBI and it's, it's hard because if, if we set up the, the anticipation or, or the idea that, you know, you go to the police, you go to these um, agencies and you're going to get help, you're going to be disappointed because you're probably not going to get help. Mm. But the reason you report is because the government officials are not going to be able to set a priority financially or resource wise on scam unless they know how many people are actually being scammed. Yeah. So we need to speak up. We need to report it so that they get an idea of, of really how big it is. Like you said, 15%, I think it's like 3%. It's very, very little numbers of, of people are reporting their scams and it's huge. It's just every day someone is being scammed every moment and we have to talk about it. So that's why I'm so vocal and I'm willing to have a target sort of speak. Um, it kind of gets me in the gut every now and then, but when I, when I speak and I hear people say, you know, keep going, keep doing it, keep educating, keep getting the word out there because you're helping somebody, then for me, it's worth having that target. But I am very careful and I'm, I'm changing phone numbers that I put out private. You know, my cell phone was out there. My real cell phone number was out there on all my public pages and that's not there anymore. Um, I, have, you know, I learned about Google, phone, Google phones, Google phone numbers. And it turns out the scammers are using a Google phone number because it comes across as a hard line, a landline, but they can text with it. And so it looks like a landline when I, when I do a white page search, but they can text so it looks like a cell number. Because um, my understanding is that they have schools set up in these countries where on a day by day, month by month, year by year basis, they're actually training these individuals um, and I'm assuming that they're, the majority of them are men to go out there and scam people and the right words to say. Now, having, you know, going through my master's in positive psychology and understanding about the, the psychology of the mind, they, these guys are very smart. You know, they know the right things to say at the right times to be able to elicit a certain response from individuals. And as you've said before, you know, you weren't stupid in any way, shape or form. You know, you were 
in the US um, Air Force, you served as an intelligence officer, you, 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 know, you did the fraud for the bank, you were a smart lady, but they knew the right thing to say. What's your understanding of these, these education centers? I, I know that they call them the kind of Google boys. No, they call them Yahoo boys. Yahoo boys. I got Yahoo the wrong boys. search yeah. engine. <laughs> and uh, they're in Nigeria. And Nigeria actually has a university that is set up for training scammers. And I was teasing one of the fellows that I, I work for this, uh, for an organization called SCARS, which is the Society for Citizens Against Romance Scams. And it's in, uh, in Miami area. And it's there. We realize that for every scammer on Facebook that we shut down their profile, 10 more go up immediately. So we're not ever going to be able to shut them down that way. You have to go where the money is. And the money is in aid to Nigeria, aid to India, aid to, you know, governmental aid. It's going to have to be on a governmental um, level. And that's what Tim, Tim is trying to work with. He just set up, he's setting up an organization in China. A woman in China, a very wealthy woman in China, was scammed. And she came over with three uh, ministers of something, finance from China, met with Tim down here, and they're going to be setting up a SCARS program in China. I'm like, oh, send me, send me. Because <laughs> we can't, you are Air Force Intelligence, something. Ooh, I don't need to be picked up as a spy in China. No. <laughs> But the idea that, that, you know, the Chinese and the, the, uh, the Brits, everybody, I mean, this, this is a world wide web. If you think of it as a, as a spider web, it's exactly what happens. And it's touching every, I think, every country in the world. And the Nigerians basically go for certain scams. The Indians go for certain scams. The people in Ghana go for certain scams. The Russians apparently are the, the most vicious in online love scams mostly against men because it's russian brides um they can get pretty physical from what i understand they can literally be at your door knocking on your door nigerians not so much they're gonna they don't have to you know they don't need a person to give them a million dollars they need a million people giving them twenty five hundred dollars and that's what happens they get a little bit of money from a lot of people and it's going to be very difficult to stop them but we can slow them down by letting people know about them and letting them know not to be scared that yes they have my address yes they have my phone number but they're most likely not coming to my house and if they do they're in my ground my territory and then i can arrest them and i can get them but i can't do anything with them across the pond you know they're out of my reach and uh and it's it that hurts your heart you know to hear of a, uh, especially an older person get hurt financially where they're going to lose their house or their retirement or whatever uh, they're going to have a hard time recovering, and many of them uh, try to commit suicide, and many of them do it. And that's sad that, that the evil of the world is making them get to that point where they just want to give up. So we have to talk. We've got to speak about it. We do, and you are one woman on a mission to make sure that this, this online scamming that is just kind of rippling out around the world is reduced as much as possible but obviously as you've said you do need people to step up and say their piece and be heard and you know go to the FBI go to Interpol go to any of these these official bodies and actually let them know what's going on because it's only when we come together and do these things that we can truly make a difference so thank you so much Debbie for coming on and telling us about your experience of online dating and obviously as you said at the very beginning it now has a very happy ending you're you've been married for how long uh two and a half years two and a half years to a lovely man who you've actually met lived with gone on dates with so if you were going to give recommendations to anybody maybe just two or three top recommendations to people that were thinking of dipping their toe into online dating in whatever way in whatever age, what would be the three top tips that you would give them to make sure that they protect themselves as best as they can? Well, the first thing is if you're putting your, when you're putting your profile together, I would not put down that you're either widowed or, or divorced. Uh, if you're gonna be on an online dating site, they should assume that you're single, okay? But don't put yourself out there because that's a red flag. Um, the other thing is don't isolate yourself. And this is what the scammers want you to do. They want you to, to get away from your friends and your family. Have a buddy 
if I had had a buddy that I sat with and she helped me with my profile and she was there to say, you know, if it says don't go off the website, then don't go off the website because the Yahoo Boys, that's why they're called the Yahoo Boys, because they get you off the website onto Yahoo, onto Yahoo Chat. Um, have someone that is there with you and, and listen to them because I have girlfriends I'm sure I pushed away. I pushed my kids away. I isolated myself and, and that was to my detriment because every time I pushed them away, Eric got closer and got more of a hold on me. Um, the other thing is, is this is for friends. If something happens to one of your friends, as it did to me, and you find out, the worst thing that you can do to them is tell them how stupid they were and that they should have, could have done something different. Why in the world did you do that? We didn't need, I didn't need to hear that from anybody. I was beating myself up enough. You need to support your friend with as much love and encouragement as you can saying, we're really sorry this happened to you. How can we support you physically, emotionally, now to get yourself back to where you need to be to become you know a, a responsible person in society again because the worst thing that you can do is to shut down the person that's been a victim in any case domestic violence or or the scammers whatever if you start telling the victim that they are bad for what they did they will have a very difficult time to recover and sometimes they even become hateful because they are like well no one's helping me so i'm gonna just lash out to the world and it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that they, you know, get scammed again or that they're mean or they're just whatever. So, you know, we all make mistakes and we all have our own stories. We have to own up to them. Um, don't make someone else's story bad because you're putting your beliefs on to what happened to them. Because we all, I like to say, we've all had something happen to us and we don't need someone giving us the shame blame. And, uh, you know, love your friends for trying for putting themselves out there because it's it's very difficult to uh to put yourself out there as a 50 year old trying to date again just remember how you felt when you were 16 and uh those anxieties are that monkey chatter still back there going, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's more than three but just you know just be careful protect your privacy protect your your personal information and that's for any social media you're on at all be careful because our stuff is out there and Anybody that wants to get a hold of our personal information is going to be able to do it. Like, because yeah, when you when you Google me, you can come up with about seven pages. If you Google somebody and you don't see anything about them, then they are made up. Yeah, they are fake, and they're using somebody else's pictures, and that somebody else is now a victim. Yes. So, just be really careful. You can have fun with it, but just be really careful. And if you don't see the whites of their eyes within two weeks. Cut it off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I mean, most definitely. And, and let's be honest, we, we, life does happen. And I, know, and I know for you with regards to Eric, he had a million different one excuses as to why you couldn't see each other and you couldn't, you know, meet up and be together. But when it becomes a regular thing, then that's when you need to say no. Yeah, then question it. Because there's a reason real good reason why he's not here and it's because he's not going to show who he really is and you don't want to be involved with somebody like that no you cut it off within two weeks because after two years it's really difficult <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much debbie for joining us it's been an absolute pleasure and hopefully it will have helped another woman out there make sure that they don't fall prey to these online dating scams so That's thank you prayer. so much for your time take care bye-bye